Please rise in body or in spirit. The Lord be with you. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Chosen, holy, and beloved, welcome to this service. We receive the greeting of the God who welcomes us into his very presence. God the Father Almighty, Jesus Christ the Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit who is here to guide and lead us. May we receive these greetings from God but likewise offer ours in our worship now and beyond this to the God that we are here to honor. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. God's love endures Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those God redeemed from the hand of the foe, those God gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. God's love endures Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and God delivered them from their distress. God led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for God's unfailing love and God's wonderful deeds for humankind. For God satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good.
may be seated. This is my father's world. 733 days of war in Ukraine. More than 27,000 people dead in the Middle East. 110 million refugees forcibly displaced worldwide. This is my father's world. This? More mass shootings in the United States in 2023 than there were days of the year. 13,000 nuclear weapons in nine different countries, 46.9% of the world living in poverty. This, this is our father's world. A world that is 1.4 degrees Celsius warmer than it was the year before. A 4% increase in deforestation and 21 species that went extinct in 2023 alone. This, this is our Father's world. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. God, you have graciously gathered us today for worship from all corners of the globe, from many different backgrounds and traditions, from our variety of experiences and lived moments. And in this beautiful place, we have joined our voices and our hearts in praise to you, triune God. But even as our praise resounds and still echoes in this room, Lord, we hold the tension. The tension of living in a world where the wrong is so great and so strong. We look at the world around us, at a marred creation, at sinful systems and a broken church and an anxiety-ridden people. And Lord, all we can ask is how long, O oh Lord? How long? God, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds. By all that we have done and by all that we have left, done. We live in broken and sinful systems, and we perpetuate and allow for broken and sinful systems. So for what we have done, and for all that we have left undone, Lord, have mercy. And God, we confess it's not just our systems that are broken. We are broken. We who serve your church and who proclaim your good news, who educate the next generation and stand up Sunday after Sunday under the mantle of leadership, Lord, we are broken. And we have sinned against you Lord, forgive us for our sins of pride and self-sufficiency. Forgive us for our deeply rooted cynicism and our overwhelming despair. Forgive us, Lord, for our sinfulness, sometimes in ways known to others and sometimes in ways known only to you. the pervasiveness of sin that touches not just us, but our communities and our churches, our world and the whole of the creation. So we cry out, how long, O oh Lord, how long? 
Lord, hear our prayers. people said. Amen. The prophet Ezekiel knew something of living in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of violence and despair and longing and lament. For whether we are by the rivers of Babylon or the shores of Lake Michigan, God's people throughout history have known what it is to ache to weep for ourselves and for the world that's around us. But God's people have and will always also know what it is to be met with the presence of the God of the exiled, the God of the displaced, and the God of the brokenhearted. Dear children of God, in hope we hear God's words of pardon and peace. As we prepare to open God's word from the book of Ezekiel, we together proclaim the song of the prophets, echoing God's eternal vow to ransom and redeemed. I invite you to join us in song. Thank you. 
You may be seated. Shall we pray? Holy, holy, holy God. It is before you that we gather, in you that we dare to see and to hear and to comprehend and to respond. The soberness of these texts that we're going to be considering this week out of the book of Ezekiel are profound and disruptive and disorienting. It is a book of challenge, enormous, enormous challenge. And it's not to them that the word is so arresting, it is to the people of God. And so may we not decide this text should really be heard by someone else but may it really be heard by us. And may we who dare to hear and respond to this text do so because you are the one who is speaking. You are the one who is guiding us. You are the one who is opening our ears, opening our hearts, reordering our lives for the sake of a work that you alone can do. It is your work. It is our hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Ezekiel is a text that few preachers would probably jump to preach on. So thank you, Scott Jose and others, for the invitation to have a chance to preach on Ezekiel. If any of you would like to do that, please feel free to come forward. I would be happy to surrender the time and give you a chance to say about Ezekiel, whatever you might like to say. I have pondered and pondered and pondered these texts and simply offer a small fragment of what could be said even about these two opening chapters. Let us read them. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the river Chabar, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord came to the priest Ezekiel, son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chabar. And the hand of the Lord was on him there. As I looked, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great crowd with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually. And in the middle of the fire, something like gleaming amber. In the middle of it was something like four creatures. This was their appearance. They were of human form. They had four faces and each of them had four wings and their legs were straight and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot. They sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. And the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each of them moved straight ahead without turning as they moved. As for the appearance of their faces, the four had the face of a human being, the face of a lion on the right side, and the face of an ox on the left side, and the face of an eagle. Each such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while the two covered their bodies, and each moved straight ahead wherever the spirit would go, and they went without turning as they went. In the middle of the living creatures, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. The fire was bright and lightning issued from the fire. 
the living creatures darted to and fro like a flash of lightning. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of burl, and the four had the same form, their construction being something like a wheel within a wheel. And when they moved, they moved in any of the four directions without veering as they moved. Their rims were tall and awesome. And the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. And when the living creatures moved, the wheels moved beside them. And when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. And wherever the spirit would go, they went and the wheels rose along with them. And the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. And when they moved, the others moved. When they stopped, the others stopped. And when they rose from the earth, the wheels rose along with them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Over the heads of the living creatures, there was something like a dome, shining like crystal, spread out above their heads, under the dome, their wings were stretched out straight, one toward another, and each of the creatures had two wings covering its body. And when they moved, I heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of mighty waters, like the thunder of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army. And when they stopped, they let down their wings. There came a voice from above the dome over their heads when they stopped and they let down their wings. And when the dome over their heads there was something like a throne in appearance, like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was something that, I, that seemed like a human form. Upward, from what appeared like the loins, I... I saw something like gleaming amber, something that looked like fire enclosed all around and downward from what looked like the loins, I saw something that looked like fire and there was splendor all around. Like the bow in a cloud on a rainy day, such was the appearance of the splendor all around. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell on my face and heard the voice of someone speaking. He said to me, O mortal, stand up. Stand up on your feet and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. Whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. And you, O mortal, do not be afraid of them. And do not be afraid of their words though briars and thorns surround you, and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of their words, and do not be dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house. 
But you, mortal, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. I looked and a hand was stretched out to me and a written scroll was in it. He spread it before me. It had writing on the front and on the back and written on it were the words of lamentation and mourning and woe. The word of the Lord. How many times has someone casually said to a friend, maybe in this case Ezekiel chatting with Jeremiah, you know, I'd be happy to do whatever the Lord wanted me to do if he would just show up and speak. (laughs) Everything would be just fine. I would be happy to do exactly what the Lord wants. He just doesn't show up and he doesn't speak. The Lord showed up, and he spoke. It happens at a time when, as many of you will be aware, Israel has been taken captive by Babylon, and the best and the brightest, we might say, were exiled to Babylon itself, even to Nebuchadnezzar's house, and Ezekiel was probably one of those priests like him. He was Just 30, the text says, the age when if all had been normal in Jerusalem time, he would have probably received his full priestly authority. Now he's sitting by an irrigation canal in a place that is not his home. As a stranger in a strange land, disoriented by a whole world of life that has been utterly turned upside down and inside out by the reality of another wave of oppression over Israel. The fascinating thing is that this word comes with such authority and power, not because it is a word to Babylon, but because it is a word to Israel and to Judah. This is for the people in their lostness, in their agony and disorientation, in their displaced life, in their sense of being overwhelmed and stripped of all the things that gave them bearing. And now the glory of the Lord is not inside the temple. It's the glory of the Lord that shows up by the river of Shadar right here by an irrigation canal. The glory of the Lord shows up. If only the Lord would show up, we say. If only the Lord would speak. Chapter 1 is this extraordinary vision, an extraordinary vision of the holiness of God, of the radiance of God, of the power of God, of the holy, unlike God that we worship, unlike us, unlike the world that's around us, unlike any of the things that we could see and touch and say, that's normal reality. No, this this is not normal reality to life lived on the human plane. This is an encounter with the God of all things, the God who is unlike us, but the God who relentlessly pursues Israel, relentlessly pursues the church and the world that God has loved. This is why Annie Dillard has commented that if we had any understanding of the power of God, we would need not just to usher people in and give them a bulletin. We should actually give them a seatbelt for the pews and crash helmets for their heads. Why? Because this is the God that we meet. Oh, we have become so familiar, so domesticated in our understanding of God. God is, well, more than we are, but not necessarily a whole lot more, really. I'm sure that I could get God on my side. I'm sure God would be part of my political party. I'm sure that God would speak my political rhetoric. I'm sure God would have my social agenda. But it is said that if the God that we worship is a God who looks and talks and votes like us, almost assuredly that is not God that we worship. And here in the opening part of this text is 
not a set of exhortations, it's an encounter which sets the stage for everything else that follows in the instructions and the harsh words of judgment and the disruptive live theater of Ezekiel portraying in what is a series of most unusual exhibits of what it took to try to get Israel's attention, to try, them, try to have them understand from the inside how unlike God they are and yet how much they are meant to be like a mirror of God. The whole purpose of God's people being called God's people is that they become people that actually look like God, act like God, portray and reflect in some genuine measure in all the places that matter most the reality of this kind of God. And though no one would ever confuse you or me with sapphire and no, no one would ever confuse us with sitting high on a throne, we are meant to reflect the glory of this kind of God, the substantive reality of this God. Not a verbal gloss, not a simple confession of faith, not a liturgical frame, but actually an embodiment individually and collectively, Ezekiel emphasizes, of the reality, the substance of this God. If anything else in this whole book of Ezekiel should be clear, this opening chapter makes that point utterly clear. We are unlike God, tragically and painfully unlike God. And God has come in this vision and in the instruction that he gives Ezekiel to proclaim and enact to the people of Israel as other prophets have done and are doing the declaration that it is they who put themselves in Babylon. They landed there because ultimately it was God who determined that if you're not going to be like me, if you don't even seem to be earnestly wanting to be like me, then you don't belong in the promised land. Why well, give you all of this, all of this evidence of my proximity, my presence, my promises, my faithfulness, my pursuit, my desire, my vision, my hopes for you? All of that is as nothing if in the end it's really about you. This is why Isaiah 58 is such a scorching text, making the same sort of point. When the prophet, God says through the prophet, you worship me as if you were people who practice righteousness. We're not meant to be an as if people of God. We're not meant to be people who say one thing and do another. You, you seek me, Isaiah 58 goes on to say, you seek me as though you want me, but it turns out that you're really not seeking me. You want me to do your bidding. You want me to be on your side. You want me to deliver what you think I should deliver to you. And you worship yourselves, not me. The, the uncomfortable call is that if God does appear and if God does show up and if God is instructing us in what we're to say and to do, it may be a whole lot closer toward an Ezekiel quality than C.S. Lewis's reference to preachers as mild-mannered people who exhort mild-mannered people to be more mild-mannered. That is not what's happening in this text. Ezekiel is flattened. He does the only thing that could and should be done, silence and prostration. This is not sort of a hey moment. This is a flattened moment. In awe, and wonder and glory, the weight and substance of God's mercy. Do we hear it? Do we understand that it's a different order of encounter? Do we realize that in fact this same God is the same God that we worship in Jesus Christ? Jesus is the one who stands between us and this reality in such a way as to 
give us a line of hope. Ezekiel will point us by the end of the book toward hope, but not before a whole bunch of chapters where it's really clear that it doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of hope. And it turns on whether we actually respond. Now, Reformed theology has always been given to a strong emphasis on the fact that God is the one who will make a way. Amen, amen, amen. By all means, read Calvin, celebrate the reality of the Reformed tradition, acknowledge the significance that we are saved by grace alone. All right, fine, I get that. I'm for that. That's just not what's happening here. <laughs> what's happening here is raw exposure to a God of righteousness and power and glory who has the right to make whatever claim on us and on the world that God may choose to make. That's the vision of this God. And the question then becomes, what next? Frankly, it would have been a profound book if it had only been chapter one and Ezekiel was left flattened. Just that could shape and change our lives if we understand what it is that it's really about. And Ezekiel only gets up because the Lord brings him up. Ezekiel doesn't decide to, okay, enough of that. Let's get on with baseball. The Lord helps him stand to see, to take in holy otherness for the sake of grasping that the task that he's about to give Ezekiel, daunting and overwhelming as it is, is a task that is grounded in the character and, and love and mercy and justice and judgment of God. This is so unlike consumer Christianity. This is so non-seeker friendly. <laughs> this, is, this is just not like that at all. It's not a vote, a popularity contest. It's not about scaling, it's not about numbers, it's not about production value, although I do have to say, this is pretty amazing production value. <laughs> but in the middle of all that, Ezekiel is called to stand, made and helped to stand, to see and to hear. He said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. Various people have their own experiences of vocation and calling. We do so in all kinds of ways, usually not involving sapphire visions and four-winged creatures, like the sound of rivers. No, we usually are just, like as Ezekiel was, just sitting by an irrigation canal wondering what God has for us to do. But if our call doesn't arise out of a depth of encounter with God, if it isn't grounded in the being of God, if it's only manufactured or, or even meaningfully adjusted for ordinary time and space, if it's not ultimately grounded in an encounter with the true and living God, then we should just go away and do something else. This doesn't arise, this vision and this speech that he's going to be called to, does not arise because of Ezekiel's desire. It doesn't arise out of his instincts. It doesn't arrive out of his priesthood. No, this is an overwhelming vision of a God who is no longer in the temple, but actually in exile with Israel. And a God who in exile with Israel is calling Ezekiel, whom he simply calls twice mortal. A statement of utter difference. I'm speaking to you as one who is among all mortal. 
I'm not asking you to do this because I'm making you a divine being. I'm not asking you to do this as he does Jesus as the incarnate son. No, it's just mortal. It has to be grounded in the immortal, but it happens through a mortal. I've not understood this. I confess it's one of the great questions I look forward to asking God. Why this economy? Why this idea of using mortal people to deliver an immortal message? Of course, it's meant to be an incarnate message, a, a message grounded in mortal existence that's for people in ordinary time and space. It's that kind of message. I, I understand that thrust, but, but it just feels so, so outrageous. How many times have I sat before the congregation I was about to preach to thinking, wow, they're all here to worship God and they think in a few moments when I stand up at that pulpit, I'm actually going to say something, period. <laughs> and that I'm going to say something about God. And it turns out I can only do it as the person that I am. But the difference here is that Ezekiel can only be Ezekiel proclaiming this word. It is just the vocation of a mortal who ingests an immortal word, who takes all the way into their being, not just this encounter with the true and living and righteous and holy God, but the character and instruction and guidance of God, the wisdom of God that comes all the way into the core. And yet so often, Preaching is, is just seen as a performance act. It's, it's seen as something not more than a couple of inches deep. It's, it's about a crowd approval. It's about minutes laughing. It's about stage presence. It's about entertainment. None of that is on this horizon. It's about God. It's about what God has revealed. And it's about how that revelation comes all the way into the mortal being of one named Ezekiel. 30. Just 30. And now to go to the rebellious people. I don't want you to go and say blessings. The Lord is with us here in the promised land. I mean in, the, in exile. It's really challenging. It's going to be hard. We can do it. Let's bound together. It'll all be fine. Hmm. Positive psychology is not the theme of the book of Ezekiel. <laughs> no, it's, it's a whole lot more indicting. It's a whole lot more painful. And he does it regularly. It's one thing to preach the one-off, quote, prophetic sermon. I'll really get in their faces this week and tell them what for. On the basis of who? On the basis of what? For what purpose? This is about a call, a confrontation, an encounter that is of the living God who gives Israel a word of instruction and a vocation to take an extremely challenging, confrontational word of judgment to Israel to actually hear and understand and see through the enactments of of Ezekiel's odd and unusual behavior to actually encounter the true and living God. That, my friends, is our vocation. If we're going to be a prophet, if we think God has called us to be a prophet, then we better have encountered God. And the word that we have to share better not be your word. It better not be your people's word, your tribe's word, your political party's word. It may not be the cu cultural moment. It cannot be your crisis. It can't be your psychosis. It actually has to be a word from God who is calling the people not just to do a little better, but to be utterly transformed by the reality of what this kind of righteousness is meant to look like which just is not looking like the church in the world. Are we the church 
in this century, in this moment, in this season, in this nation, and in nations around the world, does the church look like Jesus? I remember a graduate faculty member at the University of California, young, significant, powerful, bright, dazzlingly bright. He had become acquainted with some people who were going to our church. They introduced us. He was a religious skeptic of a pretty extreme kind. He wanted to meet because he said, basically, I've gotten everything I want, but I have no idea what any of it means. We talked and talked and talked, and eventually one day he said, so let me get this straight. If I come to your church, will I actually meet people who are like Jesus? That is a prophetic word. Lord, in your mercy, we bow before you. Hear us, O oh God. Dare we have the privilege of encountering you in your glory, not in our domestication, in your difference, and not just in your incarnational similarity. And may your word, the word that we speak, be actually your word. And may the people hear and respond. In Jesus' name, amen. We hear and we respond in song. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing. Savior's bowl and towel Teacher you are raising But child to be kind Lawyer give us hope That justice one day will surround us May God's kingdom come On earth his will be done Farmer you are working for a table full of bounty Later with each color You are teaching us to see Those are the healing hands That touch the poor and broken May God's kingdom come On earth His will be done
These words that we just sang might sound familiar. Maybe they're similar to the words that you pray over your congregation or you say to your students every day. And what good and beautiful work to have the privilege of naming light in the darkness, calling out the goodness of vocation amidst the brokenness of our world. But when was the last time someone spoke and prayed these words over you? Has it been too long? When was the last time that someone spoke goodness over your calling and prayed for the weight of your vocation? Together we offer the prayers of the people for you, the people. As we pray, we can't fall prostrate to the ground, but I invite you to open your hands whether they are open for you or for someone that you know and love. We pray for God to put God's hand on us day by day. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, in and through us, we pray that your kingdom come and that your will be done. Pastor, with each homily you proclaim a gospel of hope to a world in despair. Pastor, you prophetically name and call out injustice in the world and in your cities, sometimes in your own churches. Pastor, you tend to hearts and pieces of hearts in hospital rooms in living rooms and at your church's front door pastor you are weary from pastoring in conflict from a pace that's unsustainable and from a near constant pressure to be present God, in and through them, may your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, be close to us. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, Worship leader, week after week and season after season, you make prayerful and faithful decisions. Worship leader, you run rehearsals, not just to make beautiful music, but to make it together and to worship God together. Worship leader, you see the faces of the people. And you lead the joyful and the sorrowful alike. Worship leader, you balance strong opinions and congregational preferences. And your calling stands at the crossroads of tradition and culture. God, in and through them, may your kingdom come and your will be done. Day by day. 
professor and teacher. With each lecture, you plant seeds of knowledge and imagination in the minds of the next generation. Professor, you advise and counsel students with tenderness and compassion and with the tough love of a true teacher. Professor and teacher, in your long hours of research, you open our eyes to see God's world in new and beautiful ways. Professor, you face scrutiny and questions of your own integrity. You face pressure to publish and to produce, and you are wearied from life in the academy. God, in and through them, may your kingdom come and your will be done. Beloved child of God, it's okay to be weary and to be filled with a deep, deep longing. In these spaces of longing, God, would you grant us something of hope this day? We bring our lives and our petitions into worship and prayer, and we offer them up before you, O oh God. We bring our world and the suffering and the hurt and we offer it up before you, O oh God. We bring our churches and our families, our joys and our sorrows, and Lord, we offer them up to you. In our longing, God, would you grant us something of hope? child of God, it's okay to feel and recognize your own humanity in all of its beauty and all of its fragility. Today, may you know how deeply you are beloved by your maker. Not for what you do and not for what you are called to do, but for who you are in Christ Jesus. God, in and through us this day, may your kingdom come and your will be done. God, in and through us, may your kingdom come and your will be done. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to rise and body your spirit. Blessed are the who do not bury all the broken pieces of their heart. Blessed are the tears of all the weary, pouring like a sky of falling star. Blessed are the wounded ones in Blessed are the hurts that are not hidden, open to the healing time. 
Only the Lord would show up and speak. I'm sure it would be fine. As long as we've got a seatbelt and a crash helmet 
and we're prepared to take the Lord as seriously as the Lord deserves to be taken. May that be true in this week. May that be true in all of our work that shapes people's lives in worship. May all of that be for the sake of the glory of the God who has given his very life for the sake of redeeming a rebellious people, even now, even here, and receive this word. Now to God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, beyond all that we could ask or even imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, to God be glory in the church and in this gathering, both now and forevermore. And God's people said.
friends, uh, welcome to Calvin. My name is John Whitvliet. On behalf of all of us at the Worship Institute and the Center for Excellence in Preaching, thank you for being here. And now let us thank those who have led us this afternoon and all of the students from Grand Rapids Christian who are here also. We're grateful. I'm pleased to introduce Calvin University President, Dr. Weba Boer, who will offer greetings on behalf of Calvin University. Welcome to Calvin University. Good afternoon. Thank you to all who led this wonderful service, and I, I think we should do another clap for the amazing... It's, one, it's wonderful to have the next generation be part of this, so thank you for being here. So what a wonderful time of worship. As Calvin University president, I speak on behalf of all of us in the Calvin University community when I say we are incredibly grateful to have all of you here. As the late professor of world Christianity, La Mansane wrote, Christianity is at its heart a translatable religion. That translatability is also expressed in the diversity of worship practices to glorify God around the world. I've been blessed in my upbringing and my professional career to experience many different expressions of worship because of the places I've lived, the communities I've been part of, in Nigeria, in Trinidad, in the United States, in Canada, and in Kenya, but also in the underground church in the Islamic Republic of Mauritania, where Christian worship was actually illegal. So worship is powerful, it moves us, but it also unites us in the diversity of practice. And this is what we're celebrating here through the worship symposium. So thank you to all of those who traveled from far. I understand that we have here people from 35 US states and Canadian provinces, and 12 countries. So if you're from another country, raise your hand. Who's here? For, look at that, amazing. Welcome. <laughs> Our university is also a diverse community. We represent 49 American states, five Canadian provinces, and 55 countries. And we celebrate that diversity every day here on campus as we will celebrate through this worship symposium over the next few days. I want to thank you for your patience with our construction that you'll find around campus, and it may block your way here and there, but hopefully you'll figure out where to go. But these are signs of positive momentum toward the future of Calvin. And we do hope to welcome you back again when it's all completed so you can see the wonderful work and the wonderful construction that has gone on. But I also encourage you while you're here on our campus to take in everything our 400-acre campus has to offer. We have a nature preserve, our gym, our arena, our climbing wall, our dining halls. Engage with our students, engage with our faculty and staff. Get to know us, feel at home here. And finally, I want to express my excitement about your work during this conference, touching on so many different dimensions of Christian worship and life. The Calvin Symposium on Worship offers a truly liberal arts approach that looks at the Bible, looks at theology, the church, at music, at history, at culture, the arts, and so much more. So thanks to John Vitlead and team for the amazing work that has gone into organizing not just this conference, but leading and sustaining this global movement. And so now I pray that you have a truly blessed experience of learning and worshiping together at Calvin University this week. Have a wonderful symposium, thank you. Friends, it's gonna be an Ezekiel kind of week with all of its challenge and with its profound hope. We'll have more to say uh, following services later in the week, but for now we're eager to get you to those first sessions. Go in peace, ready to learn together, to serve, and to love each other as God's people. Go in peace.